Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Tuesday, July 14th Regional Transportation Committee meeting. Uh, the first item on the agenda is a call to order. I have done so. Uh, next item, public comment. Uh, Ms. Stevens, is there anybody for public comment? Uh, people, if there is someone, please raise your virtual hand so Ms. Stevens can uh, identify you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna go ahead and open up all the mics, including uh, people on the phone. If there's anyone on the phone for public comment, please hit star six to unmute yourself. Okay, currently I do not see any hands raised. Thank you. And I don't think I hear anyone for the phones. All right, um, thank you. With that, we will close public comment 832. Uh, next item, the June 16th RTC meeting summary. Uh, if there are any comments or changes on that, please um, please raise your virtual hand and um, identify yourself and we will call on you. If not, we will move to the next item. Ms. Stevens, um, please let me know if there's anything. All right, thank you again. Okay, and I am not seeing any hands raised. Great. Thank you. Uh, that brings us on to the action items. Uh, item four, a discussion on a technical amendment to the 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager at Dr. Cog. So this is an item that we brought to you first at your May meeting as an informational item. Um, as we're in the midst of <clears throat> preparing our 2015 Regional Transportation Plan, which is the next agenda item, we weren't anticipating uh, making any more amendments to our existing adopted 2040 uh, Regional Transportation Plan. However, in routine coordination with the E-470 Public Highway Authority, it did come to our attention that one of their projects will be opening uh, sooner than originally anticipated. Um, this project, which you should see up on your screen, is the widening, the six laning of the main line of E-470 from Quincy to I-70. Um, this project is in our 2040 Regional Transportation Plan, um, but it's in a later what we call air quality staging period of the plan. So reflecting the uh, project sooner opening than originally anticipated, this amendment is simply to move this project into, uh, into the earlier staging period uh, in the 2040 plan. So because it does involve air quality conformity, which is part of our federal requirements, uh, we did want to follow our planning process in terms of bringing this forward as an amendment. Uh, we had a public comment period. Uh, we had a public hearing uh, at our June uh, board meeting. We did receive some comments during the 30-day public comment period from Boulder County. Um, those are included in the, uh, as an attachment to this item uh, for the record to reflect uh, those comments being received uh, and the staff responses to those. Um, otherwise, um, we're just simply asking for uh, recommended approval of this amendment, um, again, to uh, bring this project in alignment um, in the plan uh, with reality of when it's gonna open on the ground. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rieger. Uh, committee members, if there are any questions, please raise your virtual hand or let Ms. Stevens know uh, via the phone instruction she gave previously. Ms. Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, looks like our first question or comment is from Jeff Coleman. Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, Jacob, Jeff here, thank you. Hey, one question is, are we just putting off the inevitable, aren't they, already beginning to work on uh, the plan to go north from I-70 up to Pena Boulevard and and how come we're not addressing that holistically but rather a piece at a time because that project my understanding will be constructed within a year or two. Yeah thank you Director Coleman so a couple things on that um, we actually just received their latest master plan uh, which we actually just reviewed as staff to make sure uh, that we're kind of in alignment with each other and what each agency is reflecting in our different long-range plans. Understand that in our existing 2040 plan and carried forward to our 2050 regional transportation plan under development, we will carry forward several projects along the E470 um, along the E470 corridor, both um, you know mainline widening projects like this one, as well as interchanges. So we have a lot of these already in our plan. Again, this amendment is really just to, and as I said, we even have this project in our plan already as well. Um, this amendment, again, is just to bring this project forward in terms of correct timing within the plan. 
Right, right. I get that. But I mean, it, it, it says 2020 to 2029, and it seems like the segment between 70 and E470 is also going to happen between 20 and 29. I, I, yeah, just, so. Yeah, sorry, Director Coleman. I, I'm not, yeah, no problem, Jacob. Go, go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah. So let me clarify a couple of things on that. The reason you're seeing on your screen here, the 2020 to 2029, let me just clarify uh, for everyone that the federal requirement around air quality conformity is um, to sort of stage these projects, so to speak, within these five or 10 year periods that we have in our plan, these buckets of, of what we call air quality staging periods. So we don't attempt to we don't attempt to stage the projects in the plan by individual year of opening. That's that's just too hard to do. And for a lot of these projects that are 10 or 20 or even longer out, that's, you know, even the project sponsor may not know. Um, so in this case, what we need to do is line up these projects within the air quality staging period buckets. The first bucket within our existing 2040 plan of our air quality staging period is the period 2020 to 2029. So that's meant to encompass all projects that, uh, that we believe are going to open within that 10 year time frame. Um, we recognize that this project is going to open very soon. Um, that's actually what triggered the amendment to make sure that we have it in this correct period. Other projects on E470 or other projects off E470 for that matter um, that are in our existing 2040 plan, we recognize um, those opening periods there as well. And that's part of what we do is to go through and make sure um, that we have these projects staged in the appropriate staging period. Um, so again, we have a lot of these projects already for E470 in our 2040 plan. Um, as I said, we just reviewed their their latest master plan, and part of our work on 2050 is to bring their projects forward identified in their master plan into the 2050 plan and to bring them forward in the appropriate staging period. Does that answer your question, Director Coleman? Yes, it does. Thank you, sir. Ms. Stevens, is there anybody else? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, it looks like um, our next question or comment is from uh, Angie Rivera Malpietti. Uh, it looks like you can go ahead and mute yourself and speak, Angie. Thanks. This is RTD Director Vince Buzik. I just wanted to make the record clear for attendance purposes. Apparently, there are three Angie Rivera Malpietti's attending. I am listed under one last month. I was Nicole Carey uh, this month. I see <laughs> Apparently, it's really difficult to get the right name with the right person. So that's all I had. Thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> um, and with that, Mr. Chair, uh, I let me see. I'm going to give everyone just another second to get hands raised. And I don't think uh, we have any other questions or comments. Great. Uh, with with no other questions or comments, uh, I can entertain a motion, please. Um, if you would like to uh, speak to a motion, please raise your virtual hand and let Ms. Stevens know. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Give it a second. Okay. Looks like our first one uh, just went up. Go ahead and state your name and make the motion for the record. Oh, you can unmute yourself. This is Kate Williams with RTD at so moved. Thank you, Director Williams. Uh, for a second, uh, please raise your virtual hand and Ms. Stevens will identify you. Uh, it looks like our second would be from Wynne Shaw. Wynne Shaw, go ahead. I second that motion. Thank you, Director Shaw. Uh, with a motion and a second, uh, Ms. Stevens, would you like to open the phone lines and uh, we will call for a vote? Okay, everyone should have the ability to vote. Great. Yes. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next item discussion of the project solicitation and evaluation process for 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Mr. Rieger again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to share my screen. I have a presentation for this one. Uh, let's see. Okay, can folks hear me and see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay. 
Well, thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, as I alluded to in the last item, we're in the midst of developing our 2015 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. So um, wanted to give everyone here today an update on what we've been working on. Uh, this is also an action item. Um, so let's jump right into it. Um, what we're really talking about here today is what we're going to call um, our proposed project solicitation and evaluation process for uh, for the 2050 plan. So Director Coleman kind of hinted at this in the last agenda item. We are now at the point in 2050 where um, we need to start thinking about how are we going to identify the major projects that <clears throat> will comprise the 2050 plan? How do we work with our partners to identify uh, and evaluate those projects? So there's kind of a lot in this process and, and what we're asking for in the motion. So I'm going to break it down for you in this presentation, but needless to say, a lot of work, as you see on the screen, has gone into this uh, with our Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, I want to thank everyone on our Transportation Advisory Committee who may be on the call today. Uh, folks put in a lot of work, as you see there on the meeting schedule, uh, over the past month and a half to get us to this point. Uh, so we've been working really hard to kind of flush this out with TAC. Uh, we're bringing it to you today, obviously, and then we we'll bring it to our board tomorrow. Uh, what are we specifically bringing to you? There's a couple components that comprises this process uh, that we'll talk about today. One is kind of what we call the overall planning framework, and I'll get to that in just a slide or two. Um, investment project, investment priority project types and eligibility. You know, how are we identifying those major investments that we care about uh, in this region for the 2050 plan? And then specifically, um, how are we going to solicit and identify and then evaluate uh, candidate priority projects for the 2050 plan? Um, so let's start with the policy framework and desired outcomes. Um, as you all probably remember, uh, one of the major things that we've been working on for the 2050 plan was a scenario analysis process um, that we had uh, been working on the first quarter um, of this year. Uh, and then we brought those results to you a few meetings ago. Um, and, and that really looked at a lot of a lot of things um, in terms of different plans, different ideas, different strategies. Not going to revisit those today, except to say that the transition from that work into this project work is really what you see on the screen. The idea here is that both Dr. Cog and our partner agencies, RTD, CDOT, local governments, we have collectively done a lot of great planning work over the last few years. Um, even just speaking for Dr. Cog, when you think of the things we've done recently, such as the active transportation plan, taking action on regional vision zero, multimodal freight plan, um, mobility choice blueprint that we did with our partners, uh, many other things that you see there. And also recognizing the good work that uh, CDOT has undertaken, um, RTD is doing reimagine. So the idea is that between all these planning processes and all this work together, we've collectively sort of set a vision for this reason, for this region. We kind of know what our needs are. We kind of know what our priorities are. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're suggesting that this collective work together is kind of that framework in which we move forward to start making some specific decisions for the 2050 plan. Um, I should note that um, this slide is full of it's full of um, plans and studies, not completely all inclusive. There's probably one or two from from a couple of the agencies that we might not have on this slide. Um, this is not set in stone. The idea is that just to recognize all the work that all the agencies have done. We will pull that forward into the 2050 planning process. Um, here's an important point that I want to make in terms of how we put the 2050 plan together, how we put any of our long-range transportation plans together. There are many different ways that we can express investment priorities in our long-range plan. Today, we're going to talk about specific projects, and that's certainly very important. Um, but there's, also, there's other ways that we do that in the plan, too, in terms of things like project categories. <clears throat> and that can be for things like maintenance or operations or other categories where um, because of the size and scope of our long-range plan, we may not identify individual projects. You know, think, for example, like local sidewalks. We don't identify local sidewalks in the plan. We don't identify every single maintenance project in the plan. Um, but those are important investment categories. Those are important project categories. Um, so we do identify them that way. Um, another way we do that is the investment allocations in the financial plan. You know, where are the dollars being allocated um, to create our financial plan and our fiscally constrained plan? And then also even in the plan itself, <clears throat> in narrative content is another way that we can emphasize what's important to this region uh, in terms of our investment priorities. So today we're going to, as I said, we're going to focus on projects. I'm not going to read all the bullets here. I have subsequent slides on them, um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the types of projects that, uh, that we're looking for in this process. <clears throat> 
and then some of these other categories of things that um, we will be working and actually are working with our partners and stakeholders uh, to identify some of these other category type things that will end up in the 2050 plan. Um, let me back up here. So one of the questions that we've had, and, and again, I think Director Coleman was sort of hinting at this, um, what happens to projects that are in our current 2040 regional transportation plan? How do they, care, how do they get carried over uh, to 2050? So we put this little framework together to kind of help folks understand how that transition will take place. Um, essentially projects that will be complete uh, by 2021, uh, we don't need to include them in the 2050 plan because they'll be complete by then. Um, projects that are um, on their way in terms of um, the NEPA process, the federal NEPA process, the project development process. Um, if they are in a NEPA process, if they have those things funded um, in our current TIP and CDOT STIP, uh, those projects will automatically be carried forward. So the idea here is that if you're a project sponsor and you've gotten far enough in your project that you have NEPA funded or you're working on NEPA or it's completed, your project is far enough along that uh, we're going to bring that project automatically into our 2050 plan. And then other projects that were in our 2040 plan that um, haven't gotten to NEPA yet, maybe there's been a, a PEL study or some type of conceptual study or other projects that were in our 2040 plan where maybe something recent you know, hasn't had a chance to happen yet. Those are the types of projects that we're looking for um, in terms of what could be submitted as a candidate project for evaluation for 2050. Um, by the same token, if there was a project in our 2040 plan uh, that was shown as locally funded back in 2040 for the 2040 plan, meaning you know maybe a local jurisdiction was going to fund the project, um, but this time around, uh, the project sponsor thinks you know that's a really great project. I, you know, working through the county transportation forums, which we'll talk about in a moment, you know, I think that's such a great project. I want to submit that uh, to compete for what we call regional funding, meaning federal or state dollars. Um, in the 2050 plan, uh, that could be a candidate project as well. Um, so let's talk about the framework uh, that in which we we're going to step through to do some of this decision making. A little bit of a flow chart here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not as complicated as it looks, but essentially this envisions a dual track process where on one track uh, we've already started as Dr. Cog working with our partner agencies, um, RTD and CDOT in particular, the regional agencies. Uh, to kind of think through regional priorities um, and, so, and some of the great work that CDOT and RTD have done. You know, CDOT has their 10-year um, pipeline of projects. RTD is working, as I said, on Reimagine RTD. So it's giving us a chance to kind of work with those two agencies directly and kind of figure out some of their regional priorities um, and, and to work on that process. The second track that we'll do in parallel is to work with our county transportation forums um, and to ask our transportation forums several of them are already starting to uh, to start on this path is to think about what are what are the local priorities at the local level and the county level um, expressed through the transportation forms that the forums want to submit to us as candidate projects for evaluation so the idea is that we work both on these track we work on both of these tracks together uh, to identify uh, some of these major project priorities at the same time, we're working on the financial plan for 2050, which will obviously enter into the conversation. And then we bring all of these things together um, in terms of identifying these projects, um, an evaluation process, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides, um, that will include representatives from all of these agencies. Um, and then together, we're creating the draft program and project investment priorities, and then bringing that forward to our committees, to you, to the board, uh, to kind of help us work through that. And then at the bottom of the screen, as you see there, um, after all of that, uh, finally getting to our final program and project investment priorities. Um, so just a little bit of uh, more detail on that dual track process. Again, um, on the one side, we're asking local project sponsors to submit uh, project priorities to their county transportation forums, um, and the forums will work together to, uh, with their local governments in each county to kind of you know, synthesize those into a set of um, candidate project priorities from each county transportation forum uh, that they'll submit to us. And then at the same time, as I, as I said, Dr. Cog will be working with CDOT and RTD to review um, all, of, all of that work that you saw on the previous slide um, at the regional level in terms of that vision and need and planning framework. Um, again, the three agencies working together to prioritize regional candidate projects. And then bringing those, all of those together, uh, both from the county transportation forums and from our regional agencies together, uh, evaluating those projects um, with an evaluation process that would include 
our three agencies, along with representatives from each of the county transportation forums, evaluating those candidate projects um, and then helping to determine uh, those investment priorities. Um, so in terms of the county transportation forms, um, the number of projects that we would have them submit to us, um, when I give this presentation, I say more than once that this is not a TIP process, and I do want to be clear on that uh, for all of you who just went through the process to create our 2020 to 23 TIP. Um, this is not that process. This is a long-range transportation plan. That said, there were many, many great things in that TIP process that we think we can borrow uh, and adapt to our long-range plan process. So one of the things that we've adapted here is using the TIP um, shares uh, for each county transportation form, each county really, um, in terms of each county share of the overall region. Uh, if you remember in the TIP, we looked at population, uh, vehicle miles traveled and employment uh, to sort of figure out the share of each county to the overall region. And we thought that that was a pretty straightforward way and a fair way to figure out how many projects each form would get to submit. Uh, so, for example, in Jefferson County, where I live, uh, Jefferson County is about 16% of the region. So we said, okay, they'd get 16 uh, project submittals. For some of our smaller uh, areas like Broomfield, Clear Creek, and Gilpin, uh, the math was actually a little smaller than what you're seeing on the screen. But we wanted to give folks a minimum number of projects uh, to be fair. So we set the floor kind of at five projects. So as you see here, it's 115 candidate projects. That sounds like a lot of projects. Uh, but as you see over on the right, a couple of things to keep in mind is that we're not going to have the revenues to be able to fund 115 projects in our uh, 2050 plan. If you look at our 2040 plan and you look at collectively the number of projects that were, that were included in the plan, uh, funded with Dr. Cog controlled revenues and CDOT controlled revenues, um, it was a number that was a lot smaller than 115. So one thing that we want folks to understand is that this is the number of candidate projects you're submitting for evaluation, but we're not going to be able to fund this many projects in the plan. So we really want to hear everyone's highest sort of investment priorities so we can focus on you know, the most important projects. Um, in terms of that solicitation uh, process for projects, uh, we have come up, and this is part of what's in your packet, uh, part of the motion for what we think we're going to be asking for from people. Um, this is where I'll say again that this is not a tip process. Um, this is not something where we're trying to make it hard for project sponsors to have to do a 40-page application, nothing of the sort. Um, you see the things that we're, that we're going to be asking for here on the screen. I'm not going to go through these individually, but these are very, you know, sort of basic, straightforward. You know, tell us about your project so that we understand uh, what this project is. Uh, further to our first item this morning about air quality staging periods, um, that is one of the items here we see in the um, proposed implementation time frame. Um, again, as I said in the earlier item, we do want to get a sense of uh, within the project sponsor's best understanding of when this project might come online uh, so that we can put it in the appropriate air quality staging period uh, for the plan to meet that federal requirement. Uh, the evaluation process, let me say a few words on that. As I said, it will be an evaluation committee made up of folks from Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, um, and each of the county transportation forums will have a representative as well. We are proposing to use a qualitative evaluation process, um, similar in some ways to what we just did for the TIP, although again, this is not the TIP, uh, so it'll be a little bit different, but um, that process seemed to work well for the TIP, and we think a qualitative process is appropriate for a 30-year plan, where a lot of these projects will be very conceptual in nature. We are proposing to evaluate the projects against what we call the primary objectives in MetroVision, in our MetroVision plan, and I'll show you a slide on that in just a second. Um, but that was, um, that was through some good conversation with our Transportation Advisory Committee, sort of thinking about the level of, the level of criteria that we wanted to have to evaluate these projects. Uh, the primary objectives in MetroVision are comprehensive enough to encompass the things that I think we all care about as a region, um, but they're also, um, they're also sort of flexible enough and they're not numerous enough that we're not overwhelming project sponsors with having to reply to or having to respond to several different things. So we think it's a good fit um, in terms of getting at what we think is important um, without, um, without making the process unduly burdensome. Uh, we also need to, as it says in the middle of the slide here, this is a federal requirement. We also need to include the performance measures from the Federal FAST Act, which is our surface uh, transportation requirements, to include that in the evaluation process. And then finally, the last bullet here on, on this slide is it says that that evaluation will be combined uh, with the draft financial plan, with the coordination between all the different agencies that I spoke about. Um, all of that will come together to determine our draft 
2050 program and project investment priorities. So a couple more slides and we're almost there on this. Um, again, this is the slide that shows the Metro Vision Plan objectives. I won't go through these individually, um, but as you sort of glance at this slide, you'll see that it's very straightforward uh, sort of things that we care about in terms of you know, housing and employment, uh, multimodal transportation, uh, maintaining a safe system, you know, again, very straightforward things that I think, you know, I think we all care about that these are priorities for the region in terms of how we look at some of these projects. The other thing that the slide is showing, as I said, it would be a qualitative evaluation. Um, this is our kind of first best guess on how we might do that. Some of these lend themselves to sort of a yes, no uh, kind of evaluation. Some of these lend themselves to kind of a high, medium, low or a one, two, three, four uh, type of evaluation. So we wanted to give people a sense of how we would translate uh, these objectives into an actual evaluation criteria. Uh, finally, on this, when it comes to the Federal FAST Act and the federal requirements that we need to include in the evaluation, there is large overlap in terms of thematic subject matter between um, those items in the FAST Act and the Metro Vision Objective. Safety is a good example uh, that shows up in both. And so where there's that overlap, uh, we will combine those so that uh, folks aren't having to answer you know, multiple questions on the same topic. Uh, we want to try and make this easy for folks. Uh, so finally, I think this is the last slide, just to say a couple words about schedule. Um, you'll see a lot of things on this slide, but just to boil it down a little bit, our critical path here is that we need to bring those draft program and project investment priorities to you. Uh, we'll bring it to TAC in September. We'll bring it to you as RTC and our board in October, uh, sort of at the top right of the screen, um, asking you to approve um, those draft project and program investment priorities. And that's so we can step into our federal air quality conformity modeling process um, as we finish out 2020, that's so that we can help get the plan, the draft plan completed uh, by about the end of this calendar year. So as you see on the lower left um, of this slide, we can step into our uh, public review uh, process, public hearing process, ultimately um, so that you as the RTC and the board can approve the 2050 plan tentatively targeting April of 2021 to do that. All of that is so that we can meet a federal deadline uh, that the feds can review and certify our plan there's actually a federal requirement, a federal deadline that the feds take action on our 2050 plan uh, by June of 2021. Uh, so in order to meet that deadline, this is what that schedule looks like. As I've been uh, going around and starting to present to the different county transportation forms, um, you know, recognize that this, an, this is an aggressive schedule. We're trying to do everything we can to make our ask of each of the forms as simple and straightforward as possible. Um, for those on the phone that you know, involved in those forms, represent those forms. I want to thank you know, all the forms that we've worked with so far. Uh, they've really stepped up to the plate in terms of uh, the schedule and the process. So we're working together to kind of set those meetings, set that process in place so that folks can identify those projects um, and submit those candidate projects to us. So I know that was a lot, um, but again, that all gets wrapped into this motion. We're asking you to recommend to the board the proposed 2050 MBRTP uh, MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan candidate project solicitation and evaluation process and criteria uh, that you've seen in this presentation and it's documented in attachments one and two of this item. Uh, so with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, committee members, any questions on the process or criteria? Raise your virtual hand and Ms. Stevens will uh, call on you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, looks like our first question or comment is from Karen Stewart. So Karen, go ahead. Thanks very much, Jacob, for a great presentation as always. And I believe the Denver Regional Council of Governments is unique in the nation really on the extensive collaborative efforts um, that so many local governments and partner agencies uh, work toward long range transportation planning and decision making. It's pretty incredible when you uh, think about how many people are involved. And um, on behalf of the Transportation Commission, I just want to thank um, everyone for their hard work by CDOT and particularly Dr. Cog working together to reach consensus on this process. We really look forward to being part of um, this continued cooperation and appreciate the efforts of everybody involved. It's complex and it's uh, time consuming. And uh, we just want to say thank you for um, working with us at Dr. Cog and uh, CDOT. Thanks very much. Thank you, Director Stewart. Is there anybody else? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our next question or comment is from Don Stanton. Don, you can go and unmute yourself. Thank you, and I was, I'll was i just second what uh, Karen Stewart said. It's really hard to 
bring in all of these uh, various groups. And I think uh, Jacob and the team at Dr. Cog have done a superb job and we really appreciate your efforts also in, in the upcoming months. Thank you. Thank you, Director Stanton. Okay, and with that, Mr. Chair, I don't think we have any other questions or comments. Thank you very much. Uh, with no questions or comments, uh, I would entertain a motion. Please raise, uh, raise your hand to present a motion, please. Okay, it looks like our first hand is from Karen Stewart. You can go ahead and make the motion. Thank you. I move to recommend to the Board of Directors to propose 2050 MVRTP candidate project solicitation and evaluation process and criteria documented in attachments one and two. Thank you, Director Stewart. Uh, Ms. Stevens, do we have a hand for a second? We sure do. It looks like it's from Don Stanton. Don, go ahead. I'd like to second yeah. the motion. Thank you very much, Director Stanton. Um, Ms. Stevens, uh, open the phone line so we can uh, so I can call for a vote, please. Okay, everyone should be able to make a verbal vote. Great. Um, all in favor, please uh, say aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the next item is an informational briefing: the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program. COVID-19 impacts. Mr. Papstorf. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. We do have one more action item. We do? Oh, I am so, thank you so much. Man, I, I am just uh, moving ahead quite frequently here. I, I apologize. Uh, next item, discussion on confirming the special interest seats on the Transportation Advisory Committee. Mr. Rieger, my apologies, Jacob. Yeah, no worries, Mr. Terry. <clears throat> I know this is my third item. I know you're probably getting tired of me. You thought you were done with me, but one more item, Mr. Chair. I uh, appreciate it very much. Um, so this item concerns our Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, in our committee guidelines at Dr. Cog, uh, we have a requirement in there to uh, conduct what we call an annual review of the Transportation Advisory Committee uh, with our board chair, the distinguished Mr. Dyack this year. Um, and so what we're doing there in that annual review is uh, sort of checking in on our local government membership in our transportation advisory committee and specific to the action that we're bringing to you today. The other element of membership on our transportation advisory committee is what we call our seven special interest seats. Um, you should see these listed on uh, your screen here. These are sort of subject matter experts in various fields that uh, relate to the transportation planning work that we do here at Dr. Cog, um, aeronautics, freight, um, you know, TDM and non-motorized transportation, business and economic development, uh, environmental concerns, seniors, and non-RTD transit are seven seats. So each year we bring this item to you directly to um, either, con you know, reconfirm uh, the members that are currently in these seats or, as is the case this year, we have a couple of vacancies that we need to fill um, in these special interest seats. Those two vacancies, as you see highlighted in yellow um, on your screen, are for the aviation seat and for, um, for the freight seat. So let me talk about just a little bit how we fill these seats. Typically when we have a vacancy on our special interest seats, uh, depending on the subject matter of the, of the seat in question, we will typically do a sort of streamlined uh, solicitation of interested candidates, uh, review those you know, very brief candidate applications and then bring a recommendation forward um, to our board chair um, to fill that seat. Um, that's what we did for, uh, for the freight seat. Um, got several good candidates, so we're we're really pleased with the uh, person here that we're recommending. Uh, some great freight experience that I think will really, uh, really be valuable to our planning process. Um, the aviation seat is a little bit different because the aviation community is actually a pretty small uh, community. Typically, this seat has been held by someone at Denver International Airport. Uh, we work really closely with them and appreciate that collaboration. Um, a couple years ago, for a little bit, this seat was held by. Um, by the executive director of the um, of the Centennial Airport. Um, this time, uh, we got interest from uh, Mr. David Ulane, who's the aeronautics director of CDOT Division of Aeronautics. Um, so we thought that that would be sort of a good perspective to bring in um, someone we haven't had before um, representing aviation interests. So what we're asking for um, is, and, and I should also clarify, by the way, this is one of the few items that we bring to RTC directly that you actually approve this does not go to our board. It's actually written in our committee guidelines that RTC as the committee that represents 
the three agencies that are part of our federally required uh, 3C, our continuing cooperative, cooperative and comprehensive transportation planning process. Um, this is sort of our RTC's charge uh, to approve this directly. So we're bringing this to you as an action item to reconfirm the five uh, folks that you see on the screen that are not highlighted, and then the two folks that we're recommending to fill the vacancies uh, together to approve these seven special interest seats for TAC. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, with that, uh, committee members, are there any questions on the uh, TAC seats? The confirmation, please raise your virtual hand and Ms. Stevens will call on you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll give everyone just a moment, just in case there's any questions or comments. Okay, and I'm not seeing any hands raised. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, with with no questions, I would entertain a motion. Please raise your virtual hand to um, present the motion, please. Okay, and give everyone a moment to get a hand up to make the motion. Okay, it looks like we have a motion from Jeff Coleman. Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I move that we uh, accept the appointment of these two new members to the TAC. Thank you, Director Coleman. Is there a second? Okay, wait for a second hand to go up. <laughs> oh, there we go. Looks like we have a second from Don Stanton. Don, go ahead. I second the motion. Thank you, Director Stanton. Um, Actually, Mr. Chair, my apologies. This is Jacob, just to make sure we do this the right way. Um, what we're actually asking for is a motion to approve all seven uh, special interest seats, including the two vacancies. All right. So, um, D Director Coleman, uh, could could you um, accept uh, uh, Mr. Rieger's? Uh, yes, I do. I move that we accept all members to the TAC. Thank you, uh, Director Stanton. Uh, can you uh, provide us a second as confirmation again, please? I second the motion. Thank you very much. Um, with, um, I, with I have my hand up. My hand up. I have my hand up. Um, it's Kate Williams. I have my hand up because I need to recuse myself from okay. this vote. Director Williams, thank you so much for the for the for your statement of recusal. Um, with that being said, I will call for a uh, call for a, a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Against. And um, I will also note uh, the recusal for Director Williams. Uh, so with that, with one recusal, uh, we have a unanimous motion without Director Williams' recusal. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, next item, informational briefings, finally. Um, I, I apologize for the last, um, last issue. Uh, item seven. 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program COVID-19 Impacts. Mr. Papstor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ron Papstorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations at Dr. Cog. Can you see my screen presentation? We can. Great, thank you. Um, thanks for the thanks for the time, everyone, this morning. Um, I wanted to bring forward a discussion item with RTC that we had with the Transportation Advisory Committee um, a couple weeks ago now, and we'll be discussing with the board um, tomorrow evening. I think you all are well aware of the economic impacts that um, we're all feeling as a result of the um, coronavirus pandemic um, that is affecting. Um, uh, a lot of aspects of the economy, but it's also affecting um, local and um, state budgets in terms of reduced um, economic activity and therefore revenue. And so there are some potential impacts to uh, locally sponsored projects in particular um, in the 2020 to 23 um, transportation improvement program that we wanted to talk a little bit about some, some concepts, some ideas, some strategies uh, for dealing with those um, issues. Um, so obviously, at this point, um, the full impact um, of the uh, of the COVID-19 um, financial impacts on local governments is is uncertain. 
It also varies across different jurisdictions, but most of the common uh, local transportation um, funding revenue streams are, are being impacted. Um, so local sales taxes, uh, local use taxes, uh, property taxes to some extent, although that can be a little bit more of a lagging um, impact. Um, and then um, highway user tax fund revenue uh, that's collected through the state gas tax and shared with cities and counties around the state is also being impacted and um, you know could be over the next three years and reduced collectively within the Dr. Cog region, cities and counties, $13 million or more over the, over the three years. Um, some agencies uh, may have difficulty implementing their uh, currently programmed uh, federally funded TIP projects because of those financial impacts. In addition to the financial impacts, there have also been sort of schedule impacts to some projects because of court closures that happened early on uh, during the response to COVID-19 uh, that slowed down in some cases right of way um, actions and determinations. Um, agencies took some time to adapt to sort of a remote work process. Um, and and sort of the the process the internal working processes and working across agencies um, and uh, the impacts on project schedules that resulted from that there were also um, in some cases we're seeing some staff reductions uh, from some of the uh, on some of the local jurisdictions that are impacting their ability to to carry forward move forward with uh, projects on the on their schedules hey ron this is yes. Melinda. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Um, unfortunately, we're not seeing your uh, slides advancing. Interesting. So they're, they're advancing on my screen. Yeah, unfortunately, all we can see is that initial launch page before you start um, a PowerPoint. A lot of times if you unshare your screen and then make it full screen before you share it, it'll work properly. Thank you. Melinda, did that, yes, did that, that slide advance? Working. Thank you very much. So um, beyond, so in dealing with those impacts, uh, one of the things that we want to um, consider are the local match requirements and the financial impacts in addition to those sort of other schedule impacts. So um, federal funds that are awarded through the Dr. Cog process, uh, those Dr. Cog directed funds for locally sponsored TIP projects, um, under federal law typically require at least a 17.21% um, non-federal match. The policy that the board adopted in developing the 2020 through 23 TIP established a minimum 20% local match for federal funds and then under state law for the multimodal options fund revenues that were allocated, um, the state requires a 50% minimum um, local match for those for those state funds. So in the total four-year uh, TIP process, 120, almost $126 million um, is committed by local jurisdictions to match federal funds uh, for locally sponsored projects, and about $121 million of local funds are committed to match um, state multimodal options fund money. So a, a pretty significant um, local commitment to leverage those federal and state dollars in the TIP. And obviously, some of those are being impacted because of the economic impacts of COVID-19 on local jurisdictions' revenues. We have um, talked to the Transportation Advisory Committee about uh, some different options to help um, mitig mitigate some of those impacts because what we all share is an interest in um, keeping these federally funded projects moving forward um, and invested in the transportation system as much as possible and as close to on schedule as possible because those investments not only address important transportation needs, but they also can, can help contribute to recovery uh, from an economic standpoint of the, the slowdown in the economy as a result of COVID-19. So two um, issues that we've talked about, and I would say we got some fairly um, consistent and um, consensus-based um, agreement from the Transportation Advisory Committee, 
is about um, taking some approach to, for some period of time, waiving or extending our delay policy for transportation improvement program projects. So we could adjust the project delay penalties or extend the cure period for project sponsors based on some demonstrated hardship, either from a funding standpoint or those sort of administrative impacts that happened and are continuing to happen. Um, so that's, that's one option. The second option is to allow project sponsors to request uh, uh, reprogramming of those federal or state funds to another year uh, based again on a demonstrated hardship experienced by the project sponsor. Um, that would allow other project sponsors to approach us to move up projects that might be programmed in later years because obviously that would free up uh, some financial ability to, to fund other projects. Um, I think based on the conversation with the Transportation Advisory Committee, a combination of those two strategies uh, felt pretty good to them, makes a lot of sense. Uh, we need to put some details uh, in terms of how long to extend uh, the cure period for um, delays, what those hardships are, and then sort of the uh, impact of reprogramming funds uh, from uh, a year when a project sponsor may have difficulty implementing the project to a later project without incurring um, a delay penalty and, and losing those program federal funds. Um, we want to be careful with these, but I think appropriately applied uh, make, us, make a lot of sense within the context of the TIP and the current situation that we're all um, facing. Um, we also um, want to make sure that we're not doing this sort of um, inappropriately and in a way that really doesn't utilize the full extent of the federal and state funds that we do have available to invest in projects. So um, we'll, we'll be looking for some, um, some demonstration from the local uh, government sponsors about the impact directly related to uh, coronavirus and the economic situation or the processes that led to uh, needing some relief from the delay policy or need to reprogram funds. The final option relates to um, the potential to backfill um, uh, committed local non-federal match with toll credits. Uh, and this would allow project sponsors to utilize toll, uh, state toll credits as non-federal match, uh, again, based on a demonstrated financial hardship. Um, many of the local governments uh, have probably seen an announcement from CDOT that um, CDOT is making available to local project sponsors. Um, uh, accumulated uh, state toll credits to, to help um, provide match to, to program federal funds. Um, they also uh, left it up to the five metropolitan planning organizations for, for projects within the NPO areas to work through with local sponsors a process for utilizing those. Um, and I'll get into toll credits here on my next slide a little bit, but just to give a little bit of context. Um, you know, toll credits accumulate to a state. Federal law allows the utilization of those toll credits to provide match to federal transportation funds uh, to uh, reduce the amount of cash, um, non-federal funds to match projects. My understanding is that CDOT has a need to utilize some of the available toll credits, but not most, and are making available the vast majority of uh, think about $800 million of toll credits statewide uh, to utilize for um, local government sponsored projects. It does come with some challenges and I do want to talk a little bit about how toll credits work here. Certainly not an expert, uh, but I'll do my best. Um, as I said, toll credits are applied as a non-federal match in order to reduce non-federal funds, but this is important. It does not provide project funding. So as an example, if there's a $1 million project uh, that uses $800,000 of federal funds and $200,000 of local non-federal funds, um, and, you want to, and you want to replace that $200,000 of non-federal funds with $200,000 of toll credits to make the project 100% federally funded, um, you you still now only have $800,000 of funding to complete the project because you can't pay a contractor with toll credits. You can match federal funds with toll credits, but you can't pay a bill with toll credits. Uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't bring real money to a project. 
So um, now that you only have $800,000 of funding to compete, complete that project, you really only have two choices. You can reduce the project scope down to the amount of money you now have, $800,000 for that million dollar project. So you're shaving $200,000 off of the scope of the project, or you bring additional federal funds to the project. Um, the $200,000 more of federal funds to the project so that you now have a million dollars of federal funds to invest in the project and you can fully fund the project. So the big policy issues for Dr. Cog are, do we allow scope reductions, which under our TIP policy, we generally do not. Uh, when we award funds, we award funds to a project and the local sponsor is expected to deliver that full scope of the project. And so, uh, as an example, when the reverse happens, if a project cost increases, um, you know, those project sponsors are not allowed to come back to Dr. Cog and ask for additional federal funds to make up that cost increase. Uh, we expect the local sponsor to find other non-federal funds to, to deliver that full scope of the project. Um, so the big policy question around toll credits in certain circumstances uh, for Dr. Cog is, do we allow scope reductions in this case um, under some demonstrated hardship in order to uh, acknowledge and uh, relieve some local jurisdiction uh, project sponsors of a financial hardship because of COVID-19 so that we can keep at least the federal funds that we have uh, flowing and invest in projects. Uh, the second policy um, issue is, you know, do we allocate unprogrammed federal funds to reduce non-federal match? So as um, you may recall, we, we do have about 13 or $14 million of non program of unprogrammed federal funds right now because we've, you know, received federal funds over the last year a little bit in excess of our original estimates when we were putting the tip uh, together. So there is some, there is some unprogrammed federal funds available that we could backfill uh, local match on some projects so that local sponsors could utilize toll credits and still deliver the full project. But again, if you hearken back that, you know, to that earlier slide where there's uh, hundreds of millions of dollars um, committed in local match during the total of the four years, the $13 million doesn't come close to filling that entire gap. So we'll never be able to uh, fill all of that or replace all of that um, local match uh, using these unprogrammed dollars uh, in combination with toll credits. But, you know, if there are hardships uh, that local sponsors are, um, are experiencing, this is an opportunity uh, to do that. So uh, for discussion purposes, um, did want to have some conversation today. And as I said, we'll be talking to the board tomorrow evening about this as well. Um, you know, on the first policy question, do we allow um, scope reductions? It does relieve the financial pressure on local agency budgets. It does reduce the overall investment in regional transportation projects, though. Um, and what do we do with um, a portion of a scope that is that is reduced? So if you had a, a two mile project and we're gonna reduce that scope in half and only deliver the first mile, what happens to the remainder of that project? Does that, auto, does that remainder of that scope automatically go to the top of the tip wait list, for instance? Or does it completely get deferred and that project sponsor would have to compete for uh, new federal funding in the next tip cycle? So that's, that's a question that we need to address. Um, the second is about uh, allocating unprogrammed federal funds to reduce the non-federal match and utilize toll credits for some projects. It does relieve the financial pressure on the local agency budgets. Uh, it does maintain as much regional investment as possible, um, but it does eliminate or reduce the amount of that unprogrammed fund that would be available to go to the existing projects on the TIP wait list. Uh, that otherwise um, could be funded with those, those unprogrammed federal funds. Um, so a concept that we're working with that we'd like to sort of get some feedback on is um, to allow the discussion through the sub-regional forums with recommendations to the regional, uh, to the uh, RTC and the board um, on those two questions. So uh, what we would, what we're um, conceptualizing here is a process where uh, the sub-regional forums 
have a conversation with amongst themselves with their local project sponsors about the um, impacts, financial impacts those sponsors are experiencing, the extent to which the intent of a project could still be delivered with uh, a scope reduction, or the extent to which that forum might want to use some of the unprogrammed federal funds to uh, replace local non-federal funding on a project in order to allow that sponsor to utilize toll credits to deliver that project and bring a recommendation forward. Um, we're aware that you know some some of the regional forums really feel like the best use of the unprogrammed federal funds in their area is to fund uh, fully fund or fund waitlist projects, and that their financial impacts uh, may not be as severe or extreme, and that they can still deliver the programmed um, projects. Um, some regional forums, there may be you know, a, a handful of project sponsors that would benefit, and so there may be some combination of utilizing some of those un unprogrammed federal funds uh, to mitigate local match and utilize toll credits, and uh, some of the federal funds may go to um, the waitlist projects, so it could be a, a mix. Uh, but we think getting that information through the sub-regional forums and the project sponsors and bringing that forward to the Regional Transportation and Regional Transportation Commission Committee and the board is the most appropriate way to approach that. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to uh, kind of open that up for discussion, uh, for feedback or, or questions from your staff. Thank you, Mr. Papstorf. Um, committee members, any questions, please raise, raise your virtual hand and Ms. Stevens will call on you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our first question or comment, you'll have to forgive me, it's one of the Angies, so I'm just going to unmute you and let you state your name and your question. That's that's probably Director Williams. Um, we like we like being Angie, I don't know how Mr. Buzak likes being Miss Buzak, but um, I'm fine with being Angie. Um, I, think that, I think that we want to move forward with scope reductions. Um, I think real strongly that anybody who is willing to make that commitment to take a look at what they're doing and try and, and shrink it um, based on the situation that we all find ourselves in that none of us anticipated being in is a good thing to have happen. Um, I'm not real sure about part two about allocating unprogrammed funds because I think that it's not a bad idea right now to have some money in the bank as it were, um, considering that we don't know what is going to happen next. And I just wanted to put both of those ideas out. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next, please. Okay, we'll give everyone just another moment. And I am not seeing any other hands raised. Oh, wait, we just had another one go up. Uh, looks like our next question or comment is from Jim Dale. Jim, go ahead. And it looks like you're self-muted, so you'll need to unmute yourself. How's that? That's great. Hi, this is Jim Dale from Golden. I really like the idea of providing flexibility to sub-regions and let us struggle or try to figure out this complex situation. I'm still hopeful about more federal funds, but we'll wait and see and see how we can do this. Um, if if some things we can reduce the scope of others, it's just really difficult and maybe we can even do some planning, but it, I think it's great to let the sub-regions work this issue. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Director Dale. Okay, and it looks like our next question or comment is from Ashley Solzman. Ashley, go ahead. Morning, everyone. Um, so this is this is a complex topic, and and I'm I'm glad we're talking about it openly today. Um, you know, unfortunately, the the COVID pandemic has been really hard in an uneven way on different areas, and so while some people's budgets are totally destroyed, other people's budgets are actually largely whole. Um, during our mayor's call, we update each other with our sales tax revenue projections and our revenue projections and certain things um, haven't been hit. Like for example, grocery has been up because of some of the hoarding effects and things like that. Uh, obviously restaurant is down, but depending on a city's mix of commercial and residential, their revenues are really going to be hit very, very differently. 
Uh, so my concern with some of the things in the proposal here is that there are people that could keep projects on track. And um, I'm concerned with just holding money and not spending it during a recession or a depression. Uh, it's one of the worst things we could possibly do to make the economy even worse than it already is. So if there are projects out there that can stay on track, we should keep them on track. And if people already know they'll have to delay, we should let those projects step aside so that other projects can get on track. And then we'll get those other projects back in the circulation in the next four year tip cycles, five year tip cycle. So I'm just, I'm concerned about holding federal funds instead of spending them on transportation projects that we desperately need to put in. So that's just the caution. And I would hope that we would try to address that and make sure that we're not delaying projects unnecessarily when things on the wait list could be funded. Thank you very much, Director Stolzman. Um, well, we, at this point, I do not see any other hands raised. Great. Um, so the uh, chair has a follow-up question to uh, uh, Mr. Papstorf. Uh, hearing Director Dale and Director Stolzman, it seems like uh, the theme is flexibility and not holding and spending federal funds. Um, could could that be addressed again at at the sub-regional level? Could those discussions happen and us get resolution um, talking about projects at the at the sub-regional level? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, definitely, I think both of those are are absolutely consistent with at least this this concept okay. where because um, I I agree with um, Director Stolzman, uh, our overarching goal is to um, help keep a, as much of the available federal funds flowing as absolutely possible. Um, and I think that's, that's shared amongst um, us and CDOT, uh, which is part of the reason they're making toll credits uh, broadly available to local sponsors, and also our federal partners who uh, don't like to see available federal funds um, not be spent and not obligated uh, uh, and have projects sort of lag which is why we have a, a fairly stringent delay policy as part of our tip. So I think uh, that flexibility and the conversation at the subregions that acknowledges the uneven impacts, as Director Stolzman um, uh, acknowledged, the uneven impacts on different jurisdictions, so that we sort of fit the right approach to the right uh, problem and the right jurisdiction and the right project. Um, so that's that's at least my takeaway. If, uh, capture the conversation correctly. Yeah, and I mean, I think to Director Stolzman's point, um, I think different subregions probably have different different challenges, and they can they can find different solutions to make their subregion better for it. I think would would be my takeaway. So um, I'm supportive. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Stevens. Any other questions or hands before I uh, I close this item out? Uh, yes, it looks like we have an additional question or comment from Ashley Stolzman. Ashley, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for that follow up. My um, so I think this will work great. What, what's proposed with the separations, doing it slightly differently, as long as we keep the the goals in mind. Um, my one concern is about the two subregions that are made up of one entity, which would be Broomfield and Denver. And it may be that they can perfectly spend all of their money, and it's not a problem. But I would encourage the staff. To work with those two subregions closely and if they need to partner with another subregion or other subregions to make something work we should explore that because all the other subregions are made up of many entities that could you know leverage whoever has the money at the time and could restage and projects but with those two entities it's just one governmental agency and so if they're experiencing a problem and aren't able to match it could create different challenges yeah, very, very, very much so. Really appreciate that. We will, we, we uh, will definitely be doing that. Ms. Stevens, any other uh, hands at this at this time? Uh, there are no other hands. Great. Thank you. Um, we will move on to the next um, next item. Thank you, everyone. Uh, administrative items, uh, item eight, member comment, other matters. If there are committee members who have um, comments or other, other matters to discuss, please raise your virtual hand at this time.
All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we'll give everyone just a moment. Okay, I don't see any hands raised. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item, the next meeting is August 18th. And with no further business before this committee, uh, we adjourn at 9.36. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.